Okay, so welcome to the American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural Thought. Uh, I am pleased uh, to be joined by my co-director, Larry Hickman, and John Shook is going to join us. He's driving between Buffalo and Washington, D.C. right at the moment, but he's joining us by phone when he can get a signal. <laughs> and so uh, uh, the American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural Thought started in December of 2016 in order to uh, continue and expand the mission of the Dewey Center. I'm pleased to say that the Dewey Center is being refunded and will be open again in the fall. Uh, um, and so we're all looking forward to that and a long partnership because AIPCT is not going to stop what it's doing just because the Dewey Center came back. But in any case, one of the things that we do is we partner with the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity for two major events a year. One is a creativity conference, which some of you attended back in uh, April. That yeah, was in April. And I'm pleased to announce that the next one is set up, and we're going to do Lynn Goodman's book on uh, uh, my Body and Mind. It's called Coming to Mind. Uh, and we've got Alan Middleman coming, and we've got a number of other really good, Lynn Goodman from Vanderbilt. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm trying to get some, some somebody cool from St. Louis. We'll see whether that works. Uh, I haven't got the acceptance yet, but that's going to be... It'll be in March, uh, but it won't conflict with SAAP. Um, also, uh, um, uh, in terms of the other thing that we do every year, it's the Han Lectures, and you are at them. Louis Hahn was a wonderful human being and a, a, a gentleman and a scholar of the first order. Uh, he taught for most of his active career at Washington University in St. Louis, and then, as so many others were, was recruited when he was forced retired at 65 uh, by Wash U. Uh, he was recruited by Delight Morris, our president at SIU then, who had also recruited Paul Schilp and a ton of other famous people who were being forced retired uh, at, that, at that time. It's now illegal, but it wasn't then. Um, does anybody know why it's now illegal? <laughs> Paul Weiss. He's the one who filed because he was forced retired from Yale and he sued him. Mm -hmm. And his son's a lawyer. <laughs> so didn't matter. It went to the Supreme Court. Paul Weiss's uh, suit did. And so uh, his collected works are in this <laughs> are in this institute, <laughs> and his papers are at SIUC. And so, uh, so anyway, the reason they can't force us out anymore is because of Paul Weiss, one of our progenitors uh, of, uh, of, of this kind of philosophy. And Lewis Hahn did the same kind of philosophy. It's this interesting pluralist, contextualist process philosophy that focuses on creativity as its central concept. And so Lewis Hahn was long the secretary treasurer for the philosophy, uh, the Society for the Philosophy of Creativity, Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity. I hope that Pete Gunner is with us. I don't know if he is, but he's the executive director. No, he's the chair of the board, and the executive director is Corey McCall, and Myron is on the board as well, and they are the ones who come up with the funding for these programs, and so I really appreciate that. Uh, all of these programs go up on our YouTube channel, which is amazingly successful, thousands and thousands of views, and I am told by the YouTubers that the most amazing thing about it, I mean, it has a lot to do with Troy, but I'll talk about him in a minute, the most amazing thing about it is the duration of view. I think our average view is more than 15 minutes, which in YouTube land, is unbelievable, <laughs> and so uh, I'm told so. Anyway, so these these talks will be going up on YouTube, uh, and uh, uh, you can check out our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube, type in American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural Thought, and it'll take you right there. Also, you can go to creativityfoundation.org and follow what's going on with creativity folks, and of course, AmericanPhilosophy.net is uh, the AIPCT. All right, so enough of that. This is, I think, the seventh Han lecture uh, that we've done. We did two back before AIPCT existed, but we've been doing them here. And about four years ago, we moved to the format that we have now, which is we honor a distinguished scholar uh, and the work of a distinguished scholar by bringing in someone who is younger, someone who is middle-aged, barely. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 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 to talk about the work of this scholar, and then we cap it off with, uh, with a talk by that scholar. As you all know, uh, Richard Schusterman is, uh, uh, has agreed to come this year and be honored 
as well as roasted a little bit <laughs> by our speakers. And what we did this year is a little different because normally we just leave it up to, uh, to the younger speakers as to what they want to talk about. But this year, and it was Richard's suggestion, we decided to focus on his, the, it's, his work cut such a broad swath. It's like, let's have a little focus. So we're, we're stepping out over the line to put it in Bruce Springsteen's turn just a little bit for AIPCT, and we're going we're gonna to be talking about Ars Erotica, um, uh, Richard's contribution to a much neglected uh, but incredibly important human topic that philosophers don't like to talk about. But the philosophers we have here like to talk about it. And so, uh, so anyway, I'm really tickled uh, at uh, what, what we've got coming today. And I didn't, did I really say that? I, at what's going on here today? Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, how this interaction goes. Unfortunately, um, our first speaker has COVID. Otherwise, Megan would be here. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Crispin and I especially were really looking forward <laughs> to meeting Megan because we're working on a book together. Um, and, uh, uh, and neither of us has ever actually met her. And that's in spite of the fact that Megan and I have done a book together already. The 21st century, you know, it's like that. <laughs> you, can, you can actually do a book with somebody you've never met uh, in person. Uh, we certainly met online. But, uh, but in any case... Megan uh, is a writer. Um, that would be the sort of primary thing that one should put forward. I have nine of her books there in the library on display, uh, including one that, the one that she and I did together on Tom Petty. Um, and uh, Megan is also, she's a poet and a commentator, pop culture commentator, uh, and uh, some of, the, some of these writings are very creative. It's a little difficult to, to identify what genre is it. I encourage you on our break to go in there and browse the books. But she's a very widely read author uh, and has worked very hard to be that. She teaches creative uh, writing. She got an MFA in, uh, uh, from Louisiana State University in creative writing. And she teaches creative writing at Kennesaw State. But uh, she spent... She did her paid her dues in the high school uh, as a high school teacher in Atlanta, but then broke broke out of that mold uh, not too long ago, and is uh, now in the gig economy and is doing. She says to me, she didn't want me to say to you, but she's doing a lot better <laughs> in the in the gig economy. It turns out that with her reputation, you can do pretty well. I'll tell you about Crispin and Richard when it's their turn to speak. But for now, I just want to turn it over to. Uh, my, my e friend and colleague, Megan Volpert, thank you very much for accepting the invitation, Megan. Hey, y'all. I am super sorry that I couldn't be there. It sucked to get those COVID results on Thursday morning as I was getting ready to like pack up the car and leave, <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, so here we are, where I will attempt to amuse and inform you for 90 minutes, which is longer than I've been able to stay awake since I got those test results. We can do it. I'm going to make it look good, too. All right. Uh, all right. Here we go. Schusterman goes to camp and ours erotica of Soma aesthetics and drag culture. This lecture aims to begin patching a gap in the emerging field of Soma aesthetics, which suffers from a kind of blind spot when it comes to queerness. Even when they occasionally gesture toward homosexuality as part of global ars erotica, philosophers have ignored the virtues exemplified by drag cultural excellence. Campiness and queening are a valuable locus for further analytical, pragmatic, and practical conversation about the art of living one's best life. Part one of five, surveying the absence of queers. As a pioneer in Soma aesthetics, Schusterman may be straight, but at least he has not been so narrow. His, he's written in support of postmodern approaches to the aesthetic and even analyzed popular media forms of rap, techno, and country music. And yet, aside from occasionally having to dip a toe into the steamy bathhouse waters of Foucault's personal kinks, Schusterman has left out performative manifestations of queerness in popular culture in the considerations of his own work. Here is the only explicit mention of drag in Schusterman's work. Quote, <clears throat> Judith Butler's arguments for the somatic performativity of gender parity, as in drag and cross-dressing, show how dramatically different aesthetic representations of female bodies can be used to transgress and subvert 
the conventional notions of gender identity, thus helping to emancipate women from the oppressive constraints that the ideology of a fixed and subordinate gender essence has imposed on them. That's from his book, Body Consciousness, A Philosophy of Mindfulness and Soma Aesthetics. Since it was published way back in 2008, we can offer him grace for that common elision there, that slide into the assumption that it's only women who get freed when we topple conventional notions of gender identity through the camp representation of them. We know now that drag emancipates everybody, even cisgendered white male philosopher Kays. So Schusterman makes plain his allegiance that he is with us, us, the queers, through this isolated invocation of Judith Butler, but it's a book from 2008, citing a book from 1990, and RuPaul has won 24 Emmy Awards since then. Plus, we're here to engage with Schusterman's newest work, Ars Erotica, Sex and Soma Aesthetics in the Classical Arts of Love. Within this new book, there are 47 mentions of homosexuality. Any wagers on how this compares to the number of mentions for prostitutes and courtesans? 78 courtesans and 30 prostitutes. So 108 mentions of people doing it for the money compared to 47 mentions of people doing it for the ass. <laughs> a quick survey of stats within the wider terrain of Soma Aesthetics fares no better than its founder. If you Google Soma Aesthetics, there are about 52,000 hits. Add drag queen to that and the count lowers to a mere 176 hits or 0.338% of total mentions in the field. A number of the coolest and most useful mentions may be left out of Google because it's not really an avenue for searching the majority of academic journals. Any wagers for how many hits there are for drag within the Journal of Soma Aesthetics itself? One, one single mention, and it's irrelevant, but it's amusing. The phrase, drag everyone off to jail in Crispin Sartwell's 2020 essay on what the drug culture meant. The results might be less depressing if we went in search of hits for more mainstream categories, the L or the G or even the B, but we are here to spill the T, that is to give voice to the experience of trans folks and gender queers and those others who cannot be bothered to conform to either heteronormativity or homonormativity. I've made a lifelong academic study out of my fandom for the fine arts of drag queening because it is a culture that speaks to me as a gender non-conforming woman who is married to another gender non-conforming woman. We're not lesbians, we're queers. Drag queens are nearly all gay men and trans women. And although I do not place any of those three specific labels upon myself, I find that our mutual interests and concerns in life overlap a majority of the time. So that is the source of my enthusiasm for analyzing the types of performance in which they engage. They are experts in the comparatively more culturally obscure fine arts of drag king that are out there, but I am not one of those experts. So that means that the kings will be left out of my lecture today. Yes, this ironically replicates part of the very absence that forms the basis for my critique, but the cup of Soma aesthetics will be fuller for its inclusion of queens, and perhaps someone will follow me on behalf of the kings. After all, it takes all kinds of fruit to make fruit cup, and Beyonce wasn't built in a day, okay? Blessedly, the, the blind spot toward queerness at large has not resulted in steering Soma aesthetics in any direction that necessarily conflicts with queer theory. Instead, we have a bouquet of caveats that sweep this blind spot aside. We have a handful of, but unfortunately, our culture has a long way to go in respecting the rights and identity of queers or other similar language. Thank you, truly, Richard, for your allyship. Now let us begin to plug this hole, ha 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 ha, especially since drag queen and culture fits clearly and easily within the field of Soma aesthetics generally and your senses of the uses of Ars Erotica specifically. Part two of five, surveying the presence of queens. The analytical branch of Soma aesthetics can and should theorize drag queening by describing how the bodily practices associated with it function to construct a queer culture with attendant aesthetic and moral values that may often run counter to those of the heterosexual majority in group. Drag opposes normativity, and yet despite its useful modes of resistance, it establishes a normativity of its own in order to proliferate and advance its culture. Drag queens are not a new phenomenon, so, so Schusterman certainly could have included them in his study of antiquities. As a cluster of methodologies, drag is as old as civilization or even sex itself. Here is a super brief history of some of the high points of drag queening across time all over the world. One, ancient Greece. Mimes and elaborate face paint who combined dance and audience participation to act out plays laid the foundation for camp aesthetics and genderqueer persona work. See especially Telestes, who was basically the first mime superstar and pioneered ways of mocking the gods as well as themes of love that would eventually yield burlesque. 
harems in the Ottoman Empire of the 1300s included not just women, but also many male dancers who dressed as women, usually just as young and as highly skilled at belly dancing or playing instruments as the women. These kochaks were in such high demand that there were reports of women in harems plotting to kill them in order to eliminate the competition. Three, Japanese kabuki theater. Originally starring women and eventually deemed too erotic for public consumption, men took over the art form in the 1600s and their approach to performing dramatic acts of femininity combined with delicately meaningful movement has been largely unchanged for 400 years since, shifting the way we ref reflect on the history of geishaism itself. Four, in Shakespearean theater in England. Men played all the iconic and queenie female roles like Cleopatra and Juliet because women weren't allowed to act on stage there until 1660. Cross-dressing was an explicit plot point in some of these stories, such as the Viola character in Twelfth Night, generating a kind of meta drag scene of layering where a man acted as a woman acting as a man. Five, Hindu Kathakali dances. Since at least the 1700s, Indian folklore tales have been performed by men who trained for years to master the art of eye dancing in elaborate makeup with ornate costuming and intense choreography. Six, vaudevillian theater all over Europe and especially in British music halls toward the end of the 1700s. Seven, the Peking opera in China whose roles were all played by men until women were allowed onto the stage in 1912. Eight, the so-called pansy craze in the early 1930s when men presented as high femme in jazz age performances that were considered the most glamorous and hedonistic of performers of their age. See also the Rocky Twins, a pair of Norwegian brothers who rose to drag fame in Paris and then toured all over the world with stunningly extravagant costumes for their signature 1920s look. See also a young Texan acrobat who began performing in drag as Barbette in 1919, beloved worldwide for daring physical feats who influenced the likes of such queer pioneers as Josephine Baker and Man Ray. And finally, nine, moving pictures became a thing. See Charlie and Sidney Chapman dragging it up in The Masquerader in 1913, or Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis in Some Like It Hot in 1959. The modern history of drag begins in the 60s, and we will pick it up there in the next section of this talk. No doubt everyone here understands drag as a performance art, but we must also answer for why it should be included in a symposium on Ars Erotica. The term Ars Erotica refers to the styles and techniques of lovemaking with the honorific title of art. We must determine in what sense the bodily practices of drag can be considered artistic in a manner that is equivalent or parallel or orbitally related to the styles and techniques of lovemaking and trace how queening contributes to the aesthetics and ethics of self-cultivation in the art of living. First, there seems to be a presumptive understanding within studies of Ars Erotica that lovemaking is not a solo activity outside the realm of aestheticism. It is usually characterized as a kind of interpersonal communication, as opposed to a more socially insulated opportunity for intrapersonal self-reflection. There are probably millions of people all over the world who either will not or cannot choose a sex life that engages another participant. And the values associated with this viewpoint should not be excluded from any serious study of Ars Erotica. Schusterman's latest book mentions masturbation 11 times, most often simply to gauge the extent to which it was explicitly forbidden or widely considered taboo. If no other part of ancient culture provides an adequate avenue for celebrating the physical pleasures available to the isolated self, then the revolutionary power of drag should be immediately clear. Queening is first and foremost a masturbatory practice because it is a calling of body and soul that has nothing to do with finding an audience. To drag up and then later to de-drag is to spend all day making love to oneself. One is called to slip one's foot into a high heel for the first time, or one is called to slide into a corset and ball gown that have all the emotional and many of the physical qualities of medieval armor. Or one is called to spend hours instinctively transforming one's face with makeup in the mirror, or one is called to move the weight off of the world's weight of the world off one's shoulders by putting on a very heavy wig, and so on. These are acts that lay bare our naked selfhood, that allow safe spaces for experimenting with one's fundamental identity and values, with an escapism and hedonism and laughing lightness that provide the comfort and confidence necessary to face the rest of the world day after day. All over the world, there are people this very day sliding into their first pair of high heels. They may be six years old, they may be six years old, and they 60 years old, and they may never feel safe enough to have an audience larger than their own conscience. The fact that they walk the runway alone should not be presumed to denigrate the validity or quality of their definitely very embodied self-cultivation in the art of living. But of course, drag also operates easily within an interpersonal communications framework for Ars Erotica, wherein a queen finds herself in performance with an audience of at least one other person. The orgasmic currency of lovemaking is replaced by other exchange values like applause and tip money. 
Much of what Schusterman unpacks about the valuation of courtesans is just as applicable to the fine arts of queening. These two groups have generally cared about a lot of the same things, visual presentation of both look and movement, talented performance, witty improvisation skills, price tag, and the superior mood of a demonstrated ability to fulfill personal purpose. The work of queens and courtesans has often conveyed shared standards of campy excellence. So let's end this section of the talk with an obvious assertion. Drag queens are sexy. Queening is often a turn on both to the people doing drag and to the people watching the drag show. So now we can really get into talking about the drag show. Part three, Shantae, you stay. Pragmatic Soma Aesthetics urges us to move beyond the simple description of drag queening as connected to Schusterman's analysis of Ars Erotica into territories where we can examine how the Soma how these soma aesthetic values of queening compare to those itemized in Schuster's, Schusterman's new book and critique examples of how best to meet these values. To some extent, the implication of this project is that homonormativity prescribes a more ideal form of living than heteronormativity, but let us not construe that as a ringing endorsement of norms themselves or of the gatekeeping or policing needed for their cultivation. We can productively use Schusterman's contextualization of Islamic and Japanese ars erotica to select a paradigmatic set of drag queen examples. His understanding of these as substantially derivative or aggregated cultures that therefore produce more variety and complexity than their ancient source materials provides a clear path to the oeuvre of RuPaul Charles, a black gay American man born in 1960, who is not as old as queening itself, but is undisputedly the most powerful conveyor of drag cultural values for his ability to choose a la carte lessons from all of drag history and synthesize, synthesize the merits of each of these values in a way that effectively proliferates them in modern society. Just as Muhammad is constructed as the last and best messenger of Muslim virtues, RuPaul is widely worshipped as the last and best messenger of drag values. Like Islam, which relies on a combination of the main text of the Quran plus reports of Muhammad's sayings and actions, as well as a large body of religious case law, RuPaul's multi-platform dominion includes a main text plus extensive web and social media presence, as well as a large body of scholarship generated by the fandoms of drag. The main text for our consideration is his reality television competition show, RuPaul's Drag Race. The show began in 2009, and in the 14 years of its run so far, it has not only launched the careers of hundreds of drag queens to carry its messages across the globe, but also spawned three additional American shows, countless one-off special programs, and 11 international shows in Canada, Belgium, Spain, France, Holland, Italy, the Philippines, Sweden, Thailand, Australia, and the United Kingdom. RuPaul is only 61 years old, which makes him a fairly young media mag magul and yet an ancient within queer history. Uh, in our culture, he is a true living ancestor who has survived tremendous hostility from society as well as the HIV AIDS epidemic of the late 20th century. As the sole judge of a long running popular reality competition show, RuPaul is the literal and explicit arbiter of what constitutes drag values. His lived experience of the logics of neoliberal capitalism and the shifting technologies of cultural inclusion have strongly influenced his sense of what drag queening can accomplish. And this informs his official rubric for picking winners. So let us compare Schusterman's list of the some aesthetic values of lovemaking with RuPaul's drag race values. The four primary categories RuPaul uses to evaluate drag queening are charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent, delightfully shorthanded as C-U-N-T values. And we can sort the majority of Schusterman's options into these four categories. His list includes beauty, grace, elegance, charm, refinement, courtesy, care, self-mastery, sensitivity to the feelings of others, and harmony, and we'll consider them in that order. RuPaul consistently judges physical beauty to be of very limited utility in the competition. Much of a queen's physical beauty is surfaced through makeup skills and expensive padding. One of his famous catchphrases is, we're all born naked and the rest is drag. Because drag queens work with and against their own bodies, generally to enhance any feminine features while masking their masculinity, any notion of natural beauty goes out the window and is replaced with consideration for how well a queen can manipulate her own body to pass as something she is not. Queens that easily pass for real women, quote unquote, are the ones who explode the very notion that woman is a natural category. So passing is valued because deconstructing the gender binary is a mission of this competition. And yet, when a queen achieves this extraordinary level of realness in her performance of female beauty, the common catchphrase on the show is, stop relying on that body. 
This means a queen is obligated to offer the world much more than stunning good looks. Beauty queens or body queens are respected for what they can do, but what they can do is considered the lowest form of success on the show. There are two interesting sidebars here. One is the show's nuanced embrace of plastic surgery and body modification. For example, Michelle Visage's breast implant saga or detox's recovery from a disfiguring car crash being construed as medical decisions to protect themselves versus Trinity the Tuck's extreme makeover or RuPaul's own Botoxing be construed, being construed as personal style choices that harm no one. The other sidebar is the show's initial refusal to allow trans women to compete. RuPaul said trans women were basically too real as women to be classified as drag illusion, but he changed the show's policy of excluding trans women in 2017 after being heavily criticized by the younger generation of queers and fans. The value Schusterman refers to as grace or elegance, charm or refinement can be bundled together under what RuPaul calls the value of charisma. I've previously published about this as the terrain of Andy Warhol and the Factory Superstars, several of whom were drag queens or trans women and the majority of whom are queer, including Warhol himself. In 1986, RuPaul arrived in New York City just as Warhol thus never became one of his official superstars. But Warhol's understanding of 15 minutes of fame and his methodologies for capitalizing on the currency of celebrity are a cornerstone of RuPaul's total media domination. RuPaul knows charisma when he sees it, but it can be difficult to objectively define. He finds grace in the smoothness of a queen's death drop into splits on the dance floor. He finds elegance in a queen's choice of simple but expensive pageant gown. He finds charm in a queen's nonverbal communication or micro expressions. He finds refinement in the clarity with which a queen steers her own total package of charisma or the instinctiveness which, with which she delivers on a challenge. On the whole, RuPaul's understanding of star quality is firmly rooted in his own experience of rising to prominence through the acclaim of the MTV generation and has grown exponentially due to his instinctive embrace of the ideas coming out of new media studies that Warhol too would have loved if he were alive today. There has been criticism of RuPaul's use of his own music video successes as the primary lens through which to judge queens on drag race, most notably centered on the example of the rise and fall and rise of alternative country drag superstar Trixie Mattel and the unanticipated difficulties of mentoring drag pop star Adore Delano. Queens who plan to do something other than music when they exit the show also often face additional scrutiny from RuPaul as he does not always see the value in more niche or modern career opportunities or trust that the pathways to success in these will be clear of major obstacles for his graduating queens. Schusterman's next value is style, which RuPaul would call uniqueness. These are equivalent with the idea being that one is self-aware and holding an individual and specific viewpoint, which is then deployed in forms appropriate to the immediate context for an audience to appreciate. Style or uniqueness is unlikely to be copied by others, either because it is of its fundamental inventiveness and outside the box that no other queens could have anticipated, or because it does something rather obviously iconic that most other queens would not be able to effectively pull off and sell as their own to their audience for whatever reason. This includes the visual activism of wardrobe choices and any messages the queens wish to convey through fashion, but it also begins to get at the queer cultural centrality of a queen's general attitude. These matters of temperament are actually the place where drag race perhaps diverges most interestingly from Schusterman's list of values. His ars erotica can bundle courtesy and care or sensitivity to the feelings of others into a total package of empathy that hinges on the value of self-mastery. Self-mastery involves awareness and then control or moderation of oneself to create the conditions of possibility for being considerate toward others. Drag race usually declares one of the non-winners to be Miss Congeniality at the end of the season, emphasizing that courtesy and care for others are indeed part of drag family values. But RuPaul's understanding of self-mastery is a departure from the way this value is understood by the ancients, who largely judge self-mastery through the evidence of moderated action. If you're not upsetting the apple carts of interpersonal communication or social contract, you've got self-mastery. But drag is usually excited to upset these apple carts. RuPaul does not encourage queens to exercise moderation as part of the mission of drag is to create space for maximal free expression. For a queen to fail at self-mastery on RuPaul's terms, her actions must be stiff or frozen due to a lack of self-confidence. RuPaul refers to this as the inner saboteur, as one of our unhealthy and unhelpful internal guiding voices that needs to be overcome before we can truly love ourselves for who we are. More to the point, RuPaul explicitly and constantly references the value of nerve as set against the value of courtesy and care. Courtesy and care are earned in the world of drag race, not freely given from the start. Nerve is about boldness and bravery. 
This value necessarily stems from the fact that gay men and trans women have always been a globally marginalized group. It is bold to stand up for one's rights. It is brave to come out of the closet because it can still get you killed or fired or ostracized by mainstream society. A drag queen must develop nerve simply in order to draw breath and move about in the world and to compete on an internationally beloved show like Drag Race with all the social media attention and financial pressure it brings, it do take nerve. This nerve often comes at the expense of other queens in the competition. Another catchphrase on the show is, this ain't RuPaul's best friends race, meaning that at the end of the season, there is only one official winner. And sometimes the competitors will need to operate strategically against other queens who they have, may have long admired or have been friends with in real life outside of the show. And most of all, nerve is on display through the library challenge, which is based on the fundamental drag queen practice known as reading or throwing shade. Queens read each other by passing amusing insults back and forth as a way of lightly hazing and then bonding with each other to make fun of their own collective and common problems, as well as to keep their insult skills sharp in case they are needed for deployment against harassment on the street. When a queen reads someone for filth, the object in this case, in this most extreme form, is to make the target feel like trash and utterly denigrate them to get them to shut up. <sighs> If reads can be said to fit into the value of courtesy and care, it is when a read takes the form of homage, as when a young queen must acknowledge a veteran queen's trademark moves or legendary status in the community to establish the basis of the joke. When a veteran queen reads a younger queen, she usually will do so with a professional or at least somewhat mothering tone, offering the joke as a way of genuinely workshopping with the younger queen and helping her to spot areas in her work that need improvement if she is going to grow up to be a truly great performer. Part of the beauty and relief of reading is that it is, it is explicit and direct, whether the tone is serious or professional or campy and hilarious. Queens can scream out a read if they're in fighting mode or simply offer it as part of general conversation while everyone is backstage before or after a show. Whereas shade is the type of trash talk that is whispered. A queen who shades is casting a chilly vibe toward another queen, but in a manner that is indirect. The shady queen might not laugh when the targeted queen makes a joke to indicate that the target isn't succeeding at being funny or isn't worthy of the shady queen's attention. A shady queen might complain about something general to no one in particular in the room, but in a way that everybody in the room knows there is only one queen who exemplifies that complaint. In this case, the targeted queen might ask, is that a read? This partly combats shade with shade, insinuating that the original insult was so weak as to be barely perceivable as an insult. But it also often results in escalation of a situation because the targeted queen is asking for more direct criticism and possibly implying that the shady queen lacked the nerve to dish up a read because she wouldn't be able to withstand any reply. A shady queen is often a lonely queen or one with a strong inner saboteur, criticized for not having enough nerve but she may nevertheless be commended for her talent in flying just under the radar of proper insult. Talent is the fourth and final category of value for RuPaul, and it is directly comparable with Schusterman's values of skill and intellect. Some queens make their own wardrobe, other queens can sing and dance, some are good at impersonation or lip syncing, others are good at reading or stand-up comedy. Every season of Drag Race offers about two dozen mini and maxi challenges to assess each of these skills in turn. Seldom has any queen swept a majority of the challenges. An outlier here is Benda La Creme, sometimes referred to as Benda La Christ because she won five out of six maxi challenges in a row and then shockingly eliminated herself instead of another queen when she was given the opportunity. This decision continues to face mixed reaction as she consistently delivered talent that was extraordinary, yet her intelligence seemed to be lacking with such a strategy for winning the game by losing it. Its valuation of uniqueness and nerve, those are clear cut. This was the second time Bendela had competed for RuPaul after she won Miss Congeniality on an earlier season. None of these queens exist in a vacuum of a single season of the show. They have often had long careers on stage before they appear on the show, and certainly all of them have had many new opportunities and fandoms once they graduate. This would be a locus for examining Schusterman's value of harmony, which RuPaul would characterize instead as legacy. Both are talking about a unity within variety, a peaceability found within oneself and in relation with fellow citizens. To a limited extent, the competitive nature of drag race is fundamentally not conducive to harmony with other people. That RuPaul chose this format to deliver the values of drag shows how his experience fight for LGBTQ plus equality and his faith in market-based resolutions for this fight presume a high degree of hostile cacophony with which queens must engage if they are to survive and infiltrate or assimilate into mainstream society. The point is not made as a critique of RuPaul's clearly neoliberal viewpoint, but rather simply to label him as a pragmatist whose ends may justify his means. 
His interest in building a legacy that achieves long-term harmony between queers and the rest of the planet overrides any short-term interest he has in choosing a more harmonious television show format where queens don't need to fight each other. RuPaul's legacy rests on whether he has succeeded in proliferating the general aesthetic principles that govern the erotic arts of drag queening. So we now turn to the practical branch of analysis in Soma Aesthetics to examine the impact of drag race upon the world. Part four of five, now available on iTunes. Robin James has theorized extensively about how white supremacist patriarchy has become multiracial, how the system has needed to become more flexible in order to move from Fordist capitalism to deregulation capitalism. This means that RuPaul will be embraced by the system for as long as his work aligns with the discipline of capitalism itself, where otherwise, as in the first 20 years of his career, he could be held off at the margins because he is black and he is an empowered queen. At first glance, it seems like RuPaul's gay agenda should explode capitalist ideology as it deconstructs naturalist gender binarism. Indeed, this is still the main objection political and religious conservatives lob at drag race, but RuPaul responds to this with a simple catchphrase, lest they pay in your bills, pay them bitches no mind. His wild marketplace success proves this more crucial point. RuPaul has developed the reflective and corporeal practices of drag queening into a branch of somatic self-improvement and styled himself into the highly profitable new age guru, offering the Soma aesthetic as a tool for resiliency. The story of RuPaul is that he overcame social prejudice and discrimination to be successful and happy, that he is essentially resilient. Capitalism loves this narrative of resiliency because if one individual can overcome hardship, then any individual can. And this denies any need to fundamentally change an oppressive system by making it seem instead as though some individuals are merely too melancholy to pull themselves up by their bootstraps like RuPaul did. Marginalization starts to look like the result of individual poor choices instead of an inherent injustice of the marketplace. These considerations are the most prominent terrain for contemporary theorization of drag culture. Perhaps drag race is changing individual lives while re assumptions that materially ruin those lives in the first place. Whether his methods will ultimately rack up more points for or against liberation of our community and whether there is any genuinely solvent alternative to his methods remains to be seen. The extent to which RuPaul himself is aware of this dilemma and whether he feels resourced by it or trapped by it also remains to be seen. His campy catchphrase, now available on iTunes, amusingly applied to a variety of things that are not available on iTunes, does indicate he has some appreciation for these critiques. Nevertheless, RuPaul makes an unironic truckload of real money off of the things he does put up for sale on iTunes. Practically speaking, there are three avenues by which RuPaul has been able to proliferate drag values as a form of somatic self-improvement. That is, the foundational text of the television series Drag Race is broken up and broadly disseminated into mainstream culture in three modes, social media conversation, drag queening merchandise, and live events that combine fandoms with productization. Let's briefly examine how each of these three modes offers corporeal methods of creative care and fashioning of the self. First, there is a vast network of groups online that extend discussion of the television show and all its component parts. Those component parts might include RuPaul's personas as in-drag judge and out-of-drag host, the permanent panel of experts like Michelle Visage and Ross Matthews, the rotating cast of celebrity guests, all the competitors both in and out of drag, the actual competition challenges, the brands who sponsor the show through prizes or provision of the material resources needed to execute the challenges. These components require a specialized vocabulary that has already often been in evidence during this lecture. The massive community of people on the internet who are talking about drag race are thus given platforms upon which to become practitioners of drag through the extensive use of drag's unique language. The show also provides examples or demonstrations of how drag tools like makeup and fashion are best used, and then the fans practice using it on the internet by sharing their own ways of achieving similarly stunning looks. This then seeps out into mainstream culture such that you can find people using catchphrases like slay queen or tongue popping without having any understanding whatsoever of the drag related etymology, nevertheless circulating their drag related values. Second, for drag queening to be a career, it must pay the bills. So even the winner of the show each season has to be able to sustain the monetization of her drag once the prize money has been spent. The most obvious money to be paid is for live gigs, but that's a lot of work when there are so many passive revenue streams that can be set up. Just like rock stars, touring drag queens mostly have music albums and tour t-shirts for sale. Many queens also set up accounts like a cameo or fans only to provide exclusive and customizable content such as a birthday greeting video for a super fan. 
Some queens just slap their logo on everything from coffee mugs to throw blankets to stickers to notebooks and wait for the cash to roll in. A handful of queens launch a line of cosmetics or maybe a fragrance. All these products contribute to the circulation of drag values and most of them are applied directly to the body of the fan. And third, there are the live events. Drag queening is a performance art that of course necessitates a stage and an audience. That stage is commonly assumed to be at a gay bar late at night with a $10 cover charge, possibly at a weekend brunch with a $20 ticket. But more often now, there are $50 tickets for a full two hour variety or cabaret style show with some of the most experienced and beloved queens like Sasha Velour raking in these ticket prices for solo and sold out performances. RuPaul himself has built an entire touring company for the RuPaul's Drag Race Work the World show so that the top queens from previous season's competition are immediately funneled into a year of tour work. He has also launched Roots Vegas. Neither of these shows has any age restriction. So again, we have the strong possibility of disseminating drag values, even in cases where the audience is a six-year-old who literally has no idea what a drag queen is. But the most impressive live event by far is DragCon, whose mission is to celebrate the art of drag, queer culture, and self-expression for all. The annual expo event began in Los Angeles in 2015. It was then followed by the launch of annual events in New York City in 2017 and London in 2020. DragCon contains a large number of academic panels, all kinds of meet and greet opportunities, dozens upon dozens of live performances, endless rows of merchandise for sale. These two day spectaculars are full of artistry and activism. In 2016, the 200 vendors at DragCon LA raked in $2.3 million. In 2018, the two United States DragCons topped 100,000 visitors and made over $8 million. RuPaul himself usually gives the keynote speech at these events and the theme is always related to self-love. DragCon has been compared to the Burning Man Festival for its similarly radical and inclusive support for all kinds of self-expression. Demographic studies of DragCon attendees reveal that its audience is only 40% male and only 60% queer. Evidence that RuPaul's values are circulating in mainstream society, particularly by appealing to straight women. Part five. Category is futurism. The survey of RuPaul provided by this lecture is not even remotely exhaustive or comprehensive of his total body of work. To do a close reading of all of it and produce the Encyclopedia Rutanica would take a lifetime. <laughs> and even if we were to accomplish that, drag queening is only the tip of the iceberg. It is absolutely the most obvious and most low hanging fruit for injecting queerness into Soma aesthetics. The study of drag queens should lead us to the study of drag kings. The study of drag as ars erotica should lead us to the study of cabaret, burlesque, and stripping that points towards strong overlap between the fields of soma aesthetics and performance studies. This injection of queerness is itself only one of the injections needed. Differently abled bodies have also been held off at the margins. Show me a cyborg soma aesthetics of assistive technologies, deaf soma aesthetics, blind soma aesthetics, old and aging bodies have been held off at the margins. Show me a decaying soma aesthetics of chronic pain management, mobility soma aesthetics, a soma aesthetics grappling with memory loss. Neurodivergent bodies have been held off at the margins. Show me an autistic soma aesthetics, soma aesthetics for highly sensitive people, soma aesthetics for those with PTSD or ADHD or OCD. All of these types of bodies have always existed, yet they are largely invisible in ancient ars erotica. So if that's where Soma aesthetic study were to end, it ends with the increasingly narrow category of heterosexuals who are youthful and able-bodied. It's clear from Schusterman's pioneering work in this field overall that he hopes it will turn into a properly inclusive discipline capable of supporting wildly diverse kinds of practitioners. His newest book contributes a beautifully wide historical background to that project, and I hope that this lecture has provided some usefully modern updates that begin to make visible at least a few of the truly gorgeous ways that queers have practiced the art of living our best lives. Thanks. <laughs> so, um, so Sabrina Hardenberg has consented to um, monitor the chat for those of you who are attending online. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat. We can't put you on the audio because it creates a feedback loop that's impossible to manage. But if you have a question, please put it in the chat. Uh, also, I want to make clear that Richard 
Schusterman is not on the spot for responding to this in any kind of detail. If he wants to, that's fine. If he doesn't, uh, then, then that's also fine. Uh, and when it comes to his talk, um, I, we made it clear that responding to Crispin and Megan is not the essence of his talk. But <clears throat> if you guys want to talk, by the way, I've been passing around, Megan, I've been passing your RuPaul book around while you were talking. Um, oh. It's now being passed around. Okay, <laughs> I, I sent it out there, but uh, uh, but just uh, just in case people want to be aware that there's a lot more detail on this, and I'm going to go in there and get your Warholia book as well, and, and and send that around so that people know about that. So that said, questions? Is anything showed up in the chat? Um, what is the distinction between gay and queer? It's a pretty basic question, but deep. Go to. <laughs> well, queer is an umbrella term that refers to really the whole spectrum of LGBTQIA, XYZ, plus, 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 whatever. You know, all of us, all of us that are, that, that are not heterosexuals. Um, gay is a specific category that usually applies to men who are interested in other men. All right, so informational. Yes, Rebecca. So I have a question, but it's not about that question. So no, of course not. No, okay, but so we can move on. So much for your talk. I mean, you know, it's just really humorous and enlightening at the same time. So I got so much out of it. So, um, but I do have some questions uh, about the um, connections you were making with pragma pragmatism and. Uh, on two points. Um, so first, just in general, right, uh, an aesthetic value, right, um, uh, methodology or a way of understanding um, experience, right? I thought that was a good way to really work with Professor Schusterman's work, right? And um, then RuPaul, you know, in, in his genius, right, he's come up with his values, yeah? Well, what's the connection with his values and feelings, right? The, the feelings that are so expressed and the overarching value of being self-expressive is the connection with somebody's feelings, how they feel. So do you or does he talk about, because you, you go through the values and you connect them in many critical ways, right, with um, lots of practical effects and consequences. But you, you don't really talk about how those va values, and I know Professor Schusterman does, uh, connect with uh, feelings, personal feelings. Well, I mean, I'm a, I, I think you're correct that I don't spend much time talking about feelings. Uh, I guess there are two reasons for that. The first is that, you know, to be, to come from a line of, of ancestors that have been sort of like systematically oppressed, there's a kind of generational trauma feeling that is maybe larger and, and more ancient than individualized feeling, which, you know, just like whatever irrational, like things pop up in my heart, I guess I would say. So there is some presumption that most queers feel similarly trod upon or against society in this way and what we're in what in the kind of fight that we're facing um so on the one hand it's presumptive of a certain being oppressed that must be overcome um and then i guess the second part is uh, a representation of, of queer excellence you know um this is something that we see in stereotypes of black women, but also in, in the stereotype of the drag queen. Part of what drag is about is being able to be fierce and tough and strong and not admit that behind that is a lot of ill will toward one's fellow human beings, right? As the, as the generators of our oppression, as the source that polices us. Um, and so, 
I mean, I guess on the one hand that I erase that sense of feeling because I too wish to demonstrate a certain amount of queer excellence. And so by not letting my feelings enter into it or really discussing the role of feeling, pragmatically for me, that is a representation of queer excellence, performatively speaking, you know? Um, so well, that's an interesting thesis, but I didn't, you know, I think that's um, kind of a meta thesis, right? Because you also talk about, and you could even talk about it uh, in the way that uh, you are approaching not talking about feelings, even though I think what you just said was quite enlightening. So thank you for your answers, and I'm sure that there would be other. Um, mode feeling modes uh, that you could think about even more maybe in the future to connect with his value categories um, but also you mentioned um, you know the the uh, sense of um, of um, ends and means right to where you know they're they're looking towards a, an end but they're using um, uh, means that aren't uh, necessarily um, part of their value system. But that is not a pragmatic choice. So I, I just thought, you know, that you might kind of want to look at that, or maybe you can correct me. Maybe I, I misinterpreted what you said. Well, she said that. And I think there are a lot of people in the in the room who would probably say, you know, for us, pragmatism doesn't mean uh, uh, what what you said. Pragmatism would never embrace the idea that somehow means trump ends. Uh, and uh, there's a you, there's a common use of the word pragmatism that we have to accede to. I mean, we have to just allow that the public uses the word this way. But the pragmatists in this room, of course, shudder when they when they hear Larry, <laughs> when they hear the that use of the word pragmatism, because we have tried our whole careers to elevate the use of the word pragmatism above that 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 popular usage. We may have failed, however, and so for that, yeah. So I uh, thank you, Rebecca, for bringing that up, and I would be curious as to what uh, Megan says about. Yeah, I mean, RuPaul's definition of pragmatism is, is very clear. If they are not paying your bills, pay them bitches no more. <laughs> right? It's a very, uh, it's a very clear. We are, we are very <laughs> unhappy about that use of the word pragmatism, but All we but we don't necessarily disagree with the sentiment behind it. We just don't want to call that pragmatism. He was quoting Dewey actually on that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I'm passing around the RuPaul book, and so uh, so everybody understands that that's sort of the context for this. Other questions? Is there anything else on the uh, uh, online? Sorry. I am not seeing further questions. All right. But if there are, please. Do Richard. Yeah, Richard so, has a question. Uh, thanks very much, and I'm um, very much. Um, and have always been encouraging of opening things up. It's part of the pluralism of pragmatism and of some aesthetics. Um, so, some corrections of um, information. So this is not my most recent book. Oh, uh, right, right. Um, <laughs> there are two more books and, since then. And, <laughs> and, and, and actually, there, there, there's one book um, that's very much concerned with gender bending. That's The Adventures of the Man in Gold which is um, a kind of book. It's a philosophical tale that's illustrated, that's based on my performance work, where I, I dance around in a leotard. Um, and so um, cross-dressing is not very far from my own experience. And um, I guess in terms of the book, because it's a book that deals with eight cultures, um, and from you know Genesis and um, the Iliad and Odyssey until the Renaissance, I had to stop there because it was I, I had to focus on um, the Main Street um, because otherwise it would have been and the mainstream in Greek culture 
includes actually an Athenian culture, because you have to distinguish Athenian culture from Spartan culture, because the women were treated very differently in Sparta. In fact, some of the women had multiple husbands, because the husbands were away, and in the Spartan context, they had to make sure that there were enough um, new Spartans, because the Spartans were um, controlling the helots, although they were only 10% of the helot population. So in Athens, um, the superior form of love was um, homosexual love. And, um, and actually, um, they were very much aware of um, cross-dressing because one of their famous heroes, a military hero, Achilles, um, for a long time, till manhood, um, went around in women's clothes because his mother heard the oracle that he would die in war, and she didn't want that. And so she hid him um, in an island um, with the king of, um, oh, it's a Greek name, Ledekimus, and put him with the king's daughters, and Achilles wore um, women's clothes throughout his childhood and young adult days. It just so happened that there was the Trojan War. And so Ulysses, um, with some other um, Greek generals, came by and um, had this trick. Ulysses is famous for being shrewd. And he brought jewels and fancy things, but also a sword. And when Achilles saw the sword, he went for it, and that's how they discovered him and dragged him off to um, Troy. And the other thing about Achilles is that his um, lover, he was married to one of the daughters um, on that island, but his lover was um, Patroclus, according to one of the legends. So, I mean, I like to talk about Greece because of its polytheism which generated uh, a polymorphic eroticism. So there's all kinds of things, including bestiality. I mean, that didn't come into your talk, but it is also a limit um, of the erotic. Lots of people love their dogs or cats more than their spouses. Um, but in the Greek, lots of legends, um, Leda and the Swan, um, Europa, bull, the minotaur. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so um, it's there, but as a scholar, and that book is more of scholarship than polemics, because it's just part of my um, philosophical truth-speaking habitus. I want to know about something before I argue against it. And part of the book, actually most of the book, was to show the roots of patriarchy and our narrow um, view of Eros, it would be good if we had developed from the Greeks. But unfortunately, as Matthew Arnold explained to us, it's Athens and Jerusalem. And Jerusalem brought a much narrower um, erotic um, than um, the Greek one. One last thing, since I don't want to um, dominate um, discussion here, is with respect to um, the agent, chapter two of body consciousness, which you graciously cited, is about women and old people. Um, and that's the chapter, and this is one of the, one of the many wonderful things about Simone de Beauvoir, is that she not only wrote about women, but her book after that, uh, one of many books after that, was uh, La Vieillesse, which in English is translated as the coming of age. And unlike um, all of the male philosophers that I know, she was someone who was brave enough to confront that problem of old people, and it reminds me of what um, Randy said about being forced to retire, right? Being forced to retire when you're 65 and you're still, for doing philosophy, in full command of your powers. But because you have a body 
that age 65, you are profiled. Um, and philosophers, believe me, we are lucky that we can avoid suffering even when we're forced to retire, as we, as we are in other countries. This is one of the reasons why I'm still living in the United States, because if I had accepted positions that were offered to me in France and Germany, I would be retired by now. That's right. But um, at least the philosopher can pretend to be um, in full command of his competencies, whereas in other professions, um, especially in the business world, where you have to project a kind of um, high testosterone caffeine energy. <laughs> if you don't have the physique for it, you are automatically um, relegated to the dust heap or the um, Alzheimer's home. So um, that, that's something that needs um, more work. Um, but to come to a confessional point in this, it's much easier and more pleasant to talk about beauty than to talk about death and decay. <laughs> and, no, I'm just saying yeah, honestly, yeah. you know, yeah, no, you're and, right. um, it, it's something that I know I um, want to address and need to address. But then when it comes down to it, it's <laughs> damn depressing. And you, I would rather look, you know, beautiful nature than at decaying bodies. But again, you know, it, it's something, you know, that has to be done. And there is some work on some aesthetics and disability. And actually, I'm sorry to go on on this riff, but um, from the some aesthetic standpoint, we're all disabled. All of us. I mean, and I've worked a lot um, with professional dancers who can do all kinds of things, but because of the kinds of things that they can do, they can't do other things. Because that's just how we, we shape ourselves into different ways. And so there are some people who um, can do drag, and you know, in the early 1990s, um, I used to go, I lived in Chelsea, I went to the limelight. I don't know if you know about that. I mean, that was a center of, of drag culture in New York. I, I lived on 19th Street um, between 8th and 9th Avenues. The limelight was on 5th Avenue, not, not far, just maybe around the 10 minute, 15 minute walk away. I spent many evenings there. So um, the, that, that was you know, part of my scene. So I, I, I really relate um, to what you say and um, it's much easier and more pleasant actually to work on drag. Than, than to work on bodies that are not so um, interesting, but like all too common. So I'll, I'll, you know, I, I don't think there was a question there, but it was just like um, you know, a dialogue. Yeah. I mean, at a minimum, I'm personally going to read it as your commendation of my bravery for being willing to address death and decay and the oppression of queer peoples to the extent that I have. Uh, you know, I guess, I mean, so much of what you said, strike. I just wanted to say, like, yes, more of that in the book, more of that. And I hear you saying that, you know, you, you are the loudest and most powerful voice in this field. And if you, you have a choice then as to whether you would like to uh, define the most evident mainstream parameters of that field in a traditional way that's expected of someone of your stature, or whether you choose to use the power that you've acquired in this field to <laughs> make more space and point to the other, you know, these other no, kinds no, of things and, that you heard and, and, you're talking about here in response. That's, that's very true, and that would require not going back to Greece, right? I mean, that would require coming in to the present. And um, you just gave beautiful examples from yeah, yeah, no, that's that's true. No, but that I, I can tell you, this is actually, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about because um, I see Randy and um, you know the music, and I've just come from St. Louis and the blues. So I'm thinking about Johnny Cash and the song <laughs> "I Walk the Line." 
right? And so one of the things that gives me symbolic power is that I walk a lot. I don't go over the bounds of what... Oh, oh hell, well. you've been going over the bounds your whole career, and you yeah, know yeah, yeah. it. No. And you did it on purpose. Come on, Richard, be no, honest. No. no, no, I am being honest. There's a question... You know this far over the bounds. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's but like, not that far. That far. <laughs> okay. it, it's, just a, it's just a question of, of, of measure. And so it's just like with the rap music. Mm -hmm. You bring the people to a place mm -hmm. where they are uncomfortable, then they become comfortable, and then you can make the next step. So if I had done a history of eroticism and focused on examples of, you know, the cross-dressing of Achilles, you know, I talk about the onagata. The onagata are these males in kabuki culture who became the models. I mean, they were really like the first drag queens in the sense that they were the models of femininity in Japan. Not women, not the princesses, but these young boys who um, played the women's parts in um, kabuki. And in fact, what happened was, first there were women who did kabuki. Kabuki was in, invented by a woman. Um, they had to prevent women actresses from doing kabuki because the samurai would fight over them and there were deaths and bloodshed. So they said, no more women, only boys. But that didn't Does stop that the problem. It didn't <laughs> stop the problem because they fought over the boys. Because the gay culture in Japan was very well developed, not only with the samurai, but the book discusses the samurai, but it focuses more on the Buddhists, um, the, the Chigo, which is the young boy, were the idols of um, the Buddhist culture. Back to Kabuki. Um, so what happened, because the samurai were killing themselves over these young boys, is that they insisted that when the boy got to a certain age where he could play a woman's part, he had to have his head shaved in the front. So he, he couldn't be taken outside the kabuki for a, a woman. So I guess what, what I wanted to say is that um, I limited myself to textual manuals um, and philosophy books with a little bit of literature. I didn't have the time or the ability, again, to confess, I got the contract for the book in 2010. I didn't deliver the book till 2021. So, <laughs> and part of the work was just learning all these cultures because I'm not a specialist in any of them. Um, another part of the difficulty in writing was I felt that I would never I didn't want to write about it because even though it wasn't about death and decay, it was so unpleasant um, because of these oppressive dimensions. So it's it's just a, uh, a question of um, of where where to go from here, and that that is a question which I've always. Um, formulated in, it's not a matter of what I do, it's what a matter of the community does. Because um, just like pragmatism, is it's a chorus of voices. Um, it's not one thing, um, but it has a commonality of interest. I think some aesthetics also, I mean, I may have invented the name and started it, but what it will be doesn't depend on me. It depends on the community of people. And so part of, um, you know, part of what I'm happy about in um, your discussion is that you're broadening it. And it's a question of also generations. I mean, when, when I went to the limelight, it was really weird in terms of normal New York kind of thing. And we were a community. When I started writing about rap music in the late 1980s, it was criminal. It was criminal. And I lost a lot of friends um, in the philosophical community for writing about that. Now it's a different world. <laughs> now, now 
RuPaul is mainstream oh. in a certain <laughs> way of thinking, you know? And so it's, I, I feel it's a question of like passing on the baton, you know, to, um, in a relay race. And, you know, that's why um, I'm always encouraged for people to talk about limitations of a book because all a book is for me, I don't fetishize them, all a book for, is for me is like a, a means of communication, a tool for communicating to others. And then what the others do with that, if they can use it to do something useful, then it's a successful book for me. And so, you know, in, in broadening the limits, yeah, that's, that's part of the goal for me of writing. And just to circle back, because it's an important point, is that from the some aesthetics point of view, we're all limited in some way. And if we're not, we soon will be. <laughs> and, and, and so the idea is also, for me, that's, that's also important in terms of the arrows. The arrows is always something about going outside yourself. And one of the problems that some aesthetics has had is that it's been seen as narcissistic. Because you know you think about your body as like a private, personal thing that you want to make beautiful. But the idea of some aesthetics is actually, by being more sensitive to the somatic, you're som sensitive to feelings and also to the feelings of other people. So one last thing, because about um, there was a while, almost two, maybe five years, when some aesthetics disappeared from Wikipedia. And I can, and it was in Wiktionary, but it wasn't in Wikipedia. So I asked once one of my graduate students, could you find out why? And the reason was, is early on, someone saw the name and posted piercing, penis piercing. There are a few images, and then it was decided to take some aesthetics off Wikipedia because it was seen as a site that promotes pornography. Now, I didn't, no one I knew who actually posted that piercing um, image. I don't know who did it, but that was enough for Wikipedia to remove it um, for several years. So, um, you know, the internet is uh, very open, but obviously th there's still some limits. And you know what? There are a lot of kids around, you know, maybe, maybe there should be limits. That's, that's, but that's another bigger question for another meeting, perhaps. Megan, what do you think? I'm deeply hung up on what you said. Gosh. About what? <laughs> uh, you cut out there. Um, About what? I am. I said I'm deeply hung up on what Richard said about Johnny Cash. Oh. <laughs> I, think, I think if you were to ask Johnny, mm -hmm. who I have studied a little bit, not extensively, but enough enough to know what I'm talking about here, I think. If you would ask Johnny what song is the mission statement that reflects his, his moral relation to the universe, he would not say it's I Walk the Line. He would oh. say it's Man in Black. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. That's true. Until then, so, I'm a man in black. <laughs> that's, that's, that's true. Yeah. That's and true. so, I, I, I'm, even I'm, though Johnny himself had an incredible amount of privilege, he was often willing to use it as a sort of um, haunting reminder of the position of the less fortunate. You know, and so I hear you saying that you have all these these experiences, which are incredibly queer related, like. Wikipedia policed you <laughs> in a way that so many, so many uh, icons of queer culture have been policed. And you have experience at the limelight. And you have, I mean, all these stories about the Greek myths and the approach to drag that is within them. And I think you have done such a good job of leaving space for young nerve upstarts like myself to come in and say, like, well, here's another puzzle piece that we can put next to all the pieces. I think also, if you have an interest and a willingness to discuss more marginal topics, that you can do it in a way that doesn't necessarily depress you with death and decay. But also, I wonder about somebody who wants to write about ars erotica without understanding that there's such a profound connection between sex and death. You know what I mean? Oh, no. Like, you can't really have one without the other, necessarily. 
And I see you wanting to be on the sunny side. That's cool, because if you feel like it doesn't affect your existence that much or your, your position that much, then maybe it's not worth it to you to endanger those things and to become one of us who are marginalized by choice. That, that, that is a difficult thing to consider. But I think, you know, how many, how many more books do you want to write that have that mainstream approach? I think it sounds like there's a part of you that really wants to yeah. play down some of these other marginalized areas. I think, I think one, of the, one of the things that characterize my work is that I write by according to what I feel. I don't think mainstream or non-mainstream. I don't write for a particular audience. I write what moves me. And um, I guess the other thing is, you can't write about everything, you know? Um, if I, it, it's just also a question of time, of time and also a sense of time that's running out and where, where, you, can, where you can make a difference. And so um, there are lots of people, for me to write about RuPaul would mean that I wouldn't be writing about other things. And those other things, um, there are fewer and fewer people writing about. Them. And so let me just say that in American society, people who are interested in history are also part of the marginalized um, population. <laughs> because in other countries, being history, history is important. In America, when you say you're history, it means you're trash, you're finished. So part, part of um, writing the book about ancient Greece and other cultures that are not American is recognizing that we in America are very much privileged vis-a-vis -vis other cultures. We live in a world of English imperialism where other languages are disappearing, where in order to be in the world um, intellectually, you have to write and speak English. Um, in Italy now, if you can't get any credit for publications unless they're in English. And so, um, in a strange way, for a contemporary philosopher to write a book about these other cultures, and also about history, is also to go against a certain mainstream, because streams are always contextualized. There are certain bubbles um, in the culture where what's in the wider culture, not mainstream, is mainstream. So, um, you know, I, I guess um, this is a, a pragmatist institution in a certain way. And I can talk in that way about William James, about the tragedy in life, is that something has to get sacrificed. You can't write about everything. You can't love all the people in the world because there's just not enough heart, no matter how big it is in you, to go around. And so you have to make choices, and sometimes the choices are made for you. And um, one is privileged when one has more choices. And I've been very lucky, you know, to have some choices, um, and more choices than some people. Some people are born in China, and so they need a visa to go to any place except North Korea and Cuba. Um, yeah, we don't think about that. We take it for granted. But, um, yeah, okay, I, I should... No, so. I think we've heard each other. Yeah. And I, I just think that I look forward to seeing your future books and my future books sitting next to each other okay. at the end of the alphabet shelf there. Okay. And, and seeing, well, seeing how they work together. In you future. know, you should look at the adventures of the man in book. Yeah, uh, which I'm passing around here uh, because Richard brought me a copy of it. So. But uh, that said, and speaking of time running out, uh, uh, we need to take about a 10 to 15 minute break. Megan, feel free to stay online with us if you're up to it. But if you're not, we all understand. COVID and actually, really thank you very much, Megan. Yes, for thank you the so effort. much. Thank you.